fine. All right, I'm going to be reading from an essay that uh, Fourth Genre has uh, graciously decided to publish. It's long. It's 16 pieces. You're not going to get all 16. We'll be here forever, and you don't want to do that. Um, anyways, this is a long but incomplete list of some of the things you don't talk about. Number one, the first time someone calls you a killer, you're a boot, and you haven't killed anyone yet. And maybe you don't want to kill anyone at all, because sure, you joined 13 days before 9-11. And after 9-11, you were ready to kill all the people responsible for making the people you love cry and afraid. But that was just talk. But killer as a name, as in someone who kills another person, it sounds wrong. But then you hear it so much, and they say it with such reverence, that you don't hear it at all, and you think, of course you're a killer. Whatever else could you be, until you get around real killers. And you realize that you aren't, and neither are they really, but you're a boot, and you don't know any better. And they see in you that you can kill with and for them, and you would, because you've seen pictures of their families, and they've seen pictures of yours, and you know their first names and things about them. And they've come over to your house to grill, and you know that, <clears throat> excuse me. And you've gone to theirs for the holidays, and you love these guys, and you'd be damned if someone tried to kill them. And so they respect you, and so you think, yes, you are a killer. And people are no longer people unless they're people you know. Otherwise, they're targets, like at the rifle range. And it takes only three pounds of pressure to kill a man. And doesn't that sound psycho? And yet you know that you wouldn't hurt anyone unless you had to, even though you were ready to kill that one fat 10-year-old because he wouldn't stay back. And you didn't say I'll kill you or anything because that shit really only happens in the movies. You just chambered around for him to see because you already had a round chambered. And you only needed to squeeze the trigger. And you remember it's only three pounds of pressure. And as you bring your weapon up and he sees the barrel and he sees your eyes and he and the adults were pressing in on you back up, you remember the sapper, Sergeant Bear, who you called Bear, or just Mike, saying that the moment when you looked at another man over your weapon, and he looks at you over yours, and he sees in your eyes that you have power to kill him or let him live, and in your soul he sees that you will kill him. You are God in that moment to that man, and you are never the same after. And you remember laughing a little to ease the tension, but then you become that man, even though you're really just a kid in his mid-twenties with a son a few years younger than he, and, and this kid you aim your weapon at, his eyes get big, and the men's eyes in the crowd get big, and they move back, and they laugh, and then you laugh. And then you realize how tense you are, but how your heart isn't beating fast this time, because you weren't scared, only tired. And your desire to get home to see your kid outweighed this poor kid's right to live, but thank God he didn't want to die that day. And you'd already been shot at, you'd already seen another man through the iron sights of your rifle, and you almost felt the release of that three pounds of pressure, until some officer said you didn't see the shot he took at you and yells at you not to, see, not to shoot. And you hesitate to obey, but he yells louder. And maybe he even grabs your shoulder, but you don't remember because you were focused on the man's head and your sights. And you were leading him just right so that he, fought, he walks into your bullet. And the slow, steady squeeze, waiting for the surprise bang when the rifle goes off. Because it should surprise you. And that's how you know it's a good shot. So we've skipped parts two, three, and four, and three and four, two of my guys get killed. It's the first two people that have, uh, two of my Marines that have ever died before. Um, <clears throat> so number five, how parts of numbers one, three, and four are what everyone thinks the war was like, but it wasn't because war is mostly waiting and sitting around and trying to sleep wherever, whenever you could, like the time you slept through a gunfight, even though you were sleeping next to a machine gun, because sleep is a luxury. And you were, all, you were mostly hungry, so hungry that you ate pigeons that some dead guy was raising, but you hadn't eaten in days, and those pigeons looked good because you hadn't eaten in days, or had mail, because the pokes whose job it was to deliver chow and mail were kind of afraid to come up to where you were. Which was funny, because where you were wasn't so bad, and that dead guy was dead because the Marines had killed him, and he wouldn't be needing his pigeons anymore anyway. And so you found a stove over there by what smelled like another dead guy, only you didn't go check. And you found a propane tank in some dirty alcove that Doc Moose had to carry for you, because it was really fucking heavy. And your hips still kind of hurt. And the Laotian doc found some rice and carrots. And the flip doc killed the pigeons. And so you all made a stew of pigeon and rice and water and carrots. And you fed the whole company. And that was the time you found a pipe that had been busted open. So you were able to take your first shower in about three weeks, give or take. And that water was so goddamn cold. But one of the best showers you've ever had. And the whole company got to shower. But no one knows about those things because those things don't make news or movies. And they're just a little too intimate to talk about outside the family. And you're kind of tired of talking about what everyone thinks the war was like and what it was really like, but you don't have anything else to talk about. Or more to the point, anything you're interested in talking about. And now that you think about it, nothing really interests you anymore. And this kind of worries you a little, and you think that maybe this helped erode your first marriage because you didn't want to talk about anything. Because in the presence of real killers and real war fighters, you know that your part was small, and it was just a job. And your biggest enemy was boredom, 
in sandstorms, but mostly boredom. And so it, what do you really need to talk about anyway? And also what wife wants to hear that her husband had to shit in a hole, or hadn't eaten, or showered, or slept, or could kill a man, but especially a child? Number 10, missing the next appointment to Iraq and feeling like you've let everyone down because you're broken, even though you refused a medevac in country for your stupid hip that keeps coming out of socket because you can't leave your chaplain defenseless and you can't leave without your friend and because only weaklings go to medical, so you didn't go until the doc makes you go. And then the corpsmen laugh at you and call you weak until they see the needle doc sticks directly into your hip. And you don't say anything at all, even when you twist the needle inside you and you can feel it scrape your bone and you and the corpsman can hear the scrape over the sound of war machinery, and then Doc tells you to turn over for the second shot, and you do. The process repeats, and after the, after, the corpsmen are quiet. They apologize, and you take those shots every other day for a few weeks, and when one of your Marines hear what you went through, he hugs you, and you're confused, because wouldn't everybody do that? Because that's what Gunny Dill and Ray and Bear said the Marine Corps was like, and you can't let them down, and your chaplain's wife is expecting you to bring your husband home to her and her four children. So how could you be a weakling and leave early? And yet a few months later, there you are on limited duty and ashamed to be alive and stateside because everyone else is doing so much more than you and you should be doing more. But you can't because your hip, hip keeps you home and your wife says, aren't you glad to be home and safe with her and your son? And you aren't. Well, you are, but you know, and you will always know what the world really looks like and that you should be out in the real world protecting the people who don't know hate or what the real world looks like, but only pretend to and how being told you are safe only makes you more ashamed and you just want to be well so you can deploy again, but you can barely walk. But hey, you have legs so you shouldn't be such a little bitch. And while you're broken and you can't deploy, you read about Fallujah and Ramadi and you die of shame for not doing your part. And then you say this to outsiders, they look at you like you're crazy, but you know you aren't, you just feel a little like Timmy, your dick fingers. And you, want any, and you don't want any of your friends to get hurt or die, or to die without you, or to get into any trouble without you, but they do. And as you sit at home stateside and go to bed, sleep in a bed every night, and you kiss your son before he goes to school, a little of you dies and cowers in shame, and you read the casualty reports, and too many names that you know are on it, and you feel powerless and ashamed that you sit at home and take your wife to the beach because no matter what any, anyone says, you didn't earn it, or at least you don't deserve it any more than anyone else does, and you remember Gunny Dill and Ray before they got blown up, and Bear talking about making sacrifices for the group and taking care of each other, so you lie to get off limited duty so you can go back to taking care of Marines even though not one of them would ever acknowledge that you take care of them. But if you have to sit in an office or put out punching cookies on Sundays for a church people one more fucking time. Number 11. For being on limb due and getting the CAS reps and having to tell your friends who've gotten out of the Marine Corps which of your mutual friends have been killed, even though you don't want to tell them because they should get on with their lives because they've earned it. But they ask, so you tell them. Number 12. Your idea about earning it in number 11 is a direct contradiction of what you said in 10, but fuck it. <laughs> number 13, that you used to cry in the shower sometimes, and other times in your car when you drove to campus because you missed it so much, but the it you missed isn't on this list, and what you missed was seeing Dave and Ray and Bear talking to their Marines and leading them, and knowing that you'd never measure up to the leaders they were but trying, it, trying in your own way, like the time you went to Oki with 2-4, uh, who just a few months before lost a shit ton of guys in Ramadi. 37, that's a record for the Iraq war. It still stands. And Henry and Dan and Castillo didn't take uh, pack their ponchos at the top of their pack like Barry taught you to do, so when it started monsoon raining, their gear was getting pretty wet pretty fast. So you had them stack their packs up so you could cover them with your poncho. And yeah, your gear got a little bit wet, but it wasn't about you. Or the time you were getting promoted and you told Bear and Ray and Finan and Frizzell and Ryan and they came to see you get promoted and your chaplain was impressed that your Marines cared enough to come and treat you like an equal. And how only Ray and Finan came to the promotion after that one because Ryan and Bear and Frizzell had gotten out. And Ray and Finan talked to your new Marines about you even though you'd been in two other units by now and weren't a boot anymore. It was kind of weird because you were only following their example and a million other moments like those that you won't share with anyone else but Marine family because those <laughs> moments are private. Stop right there. Thank you. Woo!